In this video, we will look at what you should expect when doing an inspection and test practical assessment and what you should do to prepare yourself for it. There are several comments on social media about electrical assessments and we will read things like I've got my inspection and test practical assessment next month, what happens in the assessment and what should I expect? Or I've just failed my practical assessment, what can I do? to improve my chances next time. So what can we do to help? Let's begin with an outline of any inspection and test assessment and how you should prepare for it. Most assessments will be open book and you will usually be expected to supply your own books. You will need BS 7671 wiring regulations, the correct amendment number, on-site guide, guidance note three, and any other books advised by the test centre. You will need a calculator, pen, etc. And the assessment centre should tell you if you need to bring identification, passport photographs and so on. And do you need your own test meter, voltage indicator, etc. If you take your own multifunction tester, then do take an in-date calibration certificate for it. They may want to see it. And most test centres will supply the basic tools, screwdrivers, pliers, etc. Any inspection and test assessment will expect that you practice safe working at all times and that you are able to demonstrate safe isolation and lock-off. Unsafe working can result in a failed assessment. The assessment will show if you can recognise the main components of an installation can you identify several faults with the installation by visual means? And can you carry out dead tests to find more faults? Then you will be expected to re-energise the installation safely and to carry out life testing correctly and possibly identify further faults. You must also be able to complete the appropriate test certificates and or condition reports as required and hand back the installation in a safe condition. Certificate completion is an important part of the assessment process. If you are not up to speed on certificates, then now is the time to start practising. A good assessor will explain what the expected outcome is for your assessment. For example, he might say, I want a periodic inspection done on this board with an EICR. And there are at least 10 faults to find. I want an initial verification for the second board with an electrical installation certificate. There are no faults on this board. And finally, I want a minor works certificate for the additional socket. If you are using your own test meter, then it must be in calibration with a valid calibration certificate. You must take the original calibration certificate to the test center. Make sure the batteries and test leads are in good condition and it is your responsibility to be able to use your meter correctly and perform the tests proficiently. Practice now if you need to. Test your own house, test your garage, test anything. The assessor is not there to give lessons on using test meters. If you use the centre's own test meters, do not expect more than the minimum assistance in using the meter. Most meters work in a similar way and you should be able to cope with any meter. The assessment is not a game, it is part of a professional qualification. Safe isolation procedure is so very important, so let's take a look. Before you do any inspecting and testing, you must carry out a safe isolation and lock-off procedure. Failure to carry out safe isolation and lock-off is an instant fail for most assessments. This next bit is so very important and will have caught out many candidates over the years. If the padlock is provided by the test centre and is key operated, do not give the key back to the assessor whilst the installation is locked off and under your control. Some assessors will test your alertness and ask for the key back after you have locked off your test board. If you hand the key back, this is an instant fail for unsafe working practices. You do not give the key to somebody else. If you lock off, you keep the key. The assessor wants you to say, no, sorry, I'm keeping the key until I finish. What about test certificates and condition reports? 
These matter very much and are often an area of disappointment for some candidates. They can perform the testing very well but let themselves down on the paperwork. Make sure that you know which is the correct forms to use. Know which forms go together, which schedules go with an EICR and which with an EIC. Practice form filling before the day. Copy somebody else's certificates of practice. Throw them away and copy them again. And be neat and professional. My suggestion would be, after safe isolation, to begin the assessment by starting to fill in the correct test certificate or condition report. There is a lot of information that can be entered onto the certificates just by looking at the installation. For example, the type of earthing system, the size and type of main fuse, and you can list the circuits and breaker sizes and type, the cable sizes, and so on. You may notice anomalies or faults during this process. If you do, make a note of them before you forget. A lot of candidates do not appreciate just how much paperwork can be completed just by looking at the installation. Take the schedule of test results, which is now two pages of information. The whole of the first sheet can be completed just by observation. Nothing to test, nothing to measure, just by looking. And seeing half the paperwork completed in the first few minutes of an assessment gives you a good feeling. And sheet two is completed later by testing with your meter. Now, visually inspect the installation and look for faults before you start to dismantle. There will be faults on the installation, it is why you are doing the assessment. And we start with a visual inspection, looking for things that are not correct. For example, you might notice that the wrong size MCB has been installed, where a 32 amp breaker is installed for a lighting circuit that only needs a 6 amp breaker. It is over fused. Or missing screws from a light switch. They should be easy to spot. And do look underneath surface mounted boxes or cabinets to check for holes that are not IP2X or fingerproof. This is important when carrying out a periodic inspection and completing an EICR. Your job is to report what is wrong, to record the problems that you find. So record the fault, not the remedy. You should be recording what is wrong, not what needs to be done. For example, a 20mm knockout hole in a surface box has not been blanked off, leaving a sizeable hole to put fingers through. It is not IP2X compliant. The hole is greater than 12mm. So you should record the knockout hole in the surface box is not IP2X compliant, greater than 12mm. And you should not write the surface box should have a blanking plug fitted in the empty knockout hole. So record the fault, not the remedy. Some other examples of visual faults might include unprotected connector blocks or chock blocks in the consumer unit or cabinets and trunking, burnt terminals on FCUs, sockets, etc. Excessive copper exposed at the terminals, damaged or cut insulation of conductors, perhaps no earth sleeving in the consumer unit or boxes, metal back boxes with no earth conductor. Now we can move on to dead testing. First of all, do you know your essential calculations and data? Do you know how to measure and calculate ZE and PFC for single phase and three phase installations? Three phase PFC is single phase PFC times two. But why? Find out. Do you know how to test single phase PFC on a three phase board? You will need to. If you don't know something, find out before the day. And ZS is equal to ZE plus R1 plus R2. And R1 plus R2 for a radial circuit is the same as little R1 plus little R2. Whereas R1 plus R2 for a ring circuit is little R1 plus little R2 divided by 4. Do you know how to test a ring circuit or a radial circuit? Can you test lighting circuits, one-way lighting and two-way lighting? What are the insulation resistance figures? Where is the table in the regs book? Where are the ZS tables in the on-site guide? 
Do you know the classification codes for an EICR? And when does C1, C2, C3 or FI apply? And remember that any C1, C2 or FI makes the installation unsatisfactory. Carry out dead testing as per Part 6 of the wiring regulations. You will be expected to work methodically and not jump from one test to another in a disorganised way. Follow the sequence of testing and record the results on the certificate or report as you go. The testing may reveal further faults or defects and these should be recorded or at least noted down as soon as they are found. Do not trust your memory to remember things. Let me give you an example of a typical dead test fault. Let's say that during a continuity test on a 16 amp water heater circuit you find that there is no continuity between line and neutral for the circuit. Then the same problem is found on the 16 amp fire alarm circuit. So check, there is continuity between the water heater line and the fire alarm neutral and there is continuity between the fire alarm line and the water heater neutral. The solution, the answer, is that the two line conductors are in the wrong MCBs. Both circuits will still work if they share the same neutral bar and only a dead test will pick this up. Another typical fault might be a high impedance R1 plus R2 for a lighting circuit and this is where you need to be able to use the on-site guide to find the right numbers. If the lighting circuit to the car park light is protected by a 6 amp type C MCB then it should have a maximum ZS of 2.91 ohms according to the on-site guide. But this circuit already has an R1 plus R2 of 3.9 ohms when tested. It is already too high. What is going to happen when we add on to this the ZE for the installation? The circuit ZS will easily exceed 4 ohms. So record this as a high R1 plus R2. And do take note that this will also show up on the live tests as a high ZS. Moving on to live testing now. It is very important that all cables and connections have been replaced, as many covers as possible put back on, so that only those covers that need to be off for testing are not replaced. Be certain that when you re-energise the circuit, nothing is going to happen. No bangs, no sparks, no danger. Carry out live testing in accordance with part 6 of the wiring regulations, and when live testing, ensure that you are working safely at all times. Expect to find some issues, high ZS readings, failed RCD tests, etc. When all the testing is complete, we can move to the finishing off stage, and this is part of your assessment. Think about certificates, inspection schedules, test schedules and condition reports. Have you fully completed the correct certificates and reports? Have you completed the schedule of inspections and the schedule of tests? Have you signed and dated all the paperwork where required? Is your paperwork legible, clear and with unambiguous data? Another assessor may check the paperwork and all that they have to go on is the certificates that you have just completed. The neater and more complete they are, the easier it is for the assessor to approve your work. When finishing off, the installation should be returned to the assessor in the same condition that it was in before you started your assessment. Cables in MCBs, switch covers on, lighting pendants as they were, etc. Covers should be on and properly secured. Faults that you found should not be repaired. Leave them for the next candidate. Return any tools, meters and lock-offs and tidy up. Create the impression that you are a professional. You will be making a living doing this. An inspection and test assessment is always a daunting prospect. The assessor, the test centre, wants you to pass and they will try to make your assessment as painless as possible. But you must help yourself to pass. Prepare properly and make sure that you have the right books and test meters ready for the assessment. Make sure that you can do all the tests as required by Part 6 of the wiring regulations. By far the best way to help yourself to pass is to practice as often as possible. Spend half an hour each day 
just testing something, a socket, a light fitting, anything. Spend some time just looking at a distribution board or consumer unit so that it becomes familiar. And do practice filling in certificates and reports. Take a blank EICR, schedule of inspections and schedule of tests and just fill them in with made up numbers. Make up some typical circuits and breaker sizes. Invent some faults, some observations and practice working out C codes for them. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense to anybody else. The mere act of putting pen to paper is what is going to help you. And good luck. Thank you for watching. It really is appreciated. And we hope that you found this video useful. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos. And remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.